Before we get started real good, you know, maybe I can kind of take trail off of that song a little bit to where we understand because in my message today, we're really going to be, the message really today has a lot to do with people that are believers. Um, people, in other words, people that have been born again in Christ and are servants of the Lord. And what does that mean? Well, we may be at various levels of our understanding and that's understandable. I can remember the first time I sat in the church and really didn't understand much of what I was hearing, but nevertheless, the spirit of God was there and it began to deal with my heart. This, this song speaks of a time, even in the Old Testament, where there was, in the Old Testament, we talk about types and shadows. It means things that came before that were almost like road signs or preparing the way before Jesus would come. So the concept of the mercy seat comes at about 1450 BC during the time frame of Moses. This doesn't have anything to do with my message. I'm just trying to give you like a little precursor. And so it says in Exodus chapter 25, Exodus is the book where God led the children of Israel out from Egyptian bondage. I've said it to the church many times, but Egypt is a type of the world and Pharaoh is a type of the enemy or Satan. Uh, if you believe in God, you got to believe in the devil, my friend, because you got to understand that God has an arch enemy. His name is Satan, and he wants to destroy people, and he wants to cause confusion and deception. He really does. He really wants your soul. He wants my soul. He wants your friend's souls. He wants to send people to hell, and that's just the truth of the Bible, if you believe the Bible this morning. And the Word of God says that the children of Israel were locked up. They were bound up like slaves in Egypt. Many times we don't even realize that, but we'll be slaves in our own lives. And Jesus has come to liberate us. The Bible says he quoted Psalm Isaiah 61 in Luke chapter 4. And he said, the spirit of the Lord has anointed me to preach the good news to those that are captive. Amen. To release, uh, open up the prison doors and to release people. One thing I can tell you is I served God for 12 years and didn't even realize I was a captive until the Lord set me free. So it happens even in people that love the Lord. They don't realize. We don't realize many times how bound up we are. But going back to the mercy seat. He said in Exodus 25, he said, build me a tabernacle. It was a tent. He said, so that my presence can dwell with my people. And there were multiple layers. But beyond the veil, there was a place called the holiest of holies. Within the holiest of holies, there was an Ark of the Covenant. You've probably seen the box before in movies. They talk about it, Raiders of the Lost Ark. There was a ta uh, covering that laid upon it. And there were two angels called cherubim that faced one another and looked down on the mercy seat. But beneath the, 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 the covering, there was tablets. Tablets of the law. It was the law of Moses. And you see, the law of Moses was broken in the eyes of God because God's people could not keep the law any more than you nor I can keep the law. That's right, that's right. The good news is that Jesus kept the law. But the law was broken during the time frame of Israel and once a year on something called the Day of Atonement, the high priest would, he would slaughter an animal and he would take the blood and first he'd have to kill one for his own sin because men are sin. Don't believe it whenever they tell you that the Pope is infallible because there was only one man that died without sin and his name was Jesus. But the high priest would have to offer up an animal first for his own sin and he would go in and he would sprinkle the blood and then he would go back out and he would kill another animal and he would bring that blood beyond the veil into the Holy of Holies and he would sprinkle blood seven times upon the mercy seat. And what it would do is now the presence of the Lord represented by those angels no longer was looking through this covering upon the box. And into the broken law, but instead their eyes were fixated upon the blood of an innocent man. The Apostle Paul says in the letter to the Roman church that Christ is our propitiation. Yeah. That word propitiation literally means he was our mercy seat. Yeah. Jesus is your mercy seat. See, even though each and every one of us have failed God, even though each and every one of us in our own lives have broken the law, I have good news for you this morning. Jesus made the way so that you and I could be redeemed, so that we could be forgiven of our sin. But if we have never received Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, we stand guilty. We stand guilty in the eyes of God, the law of God being broken by us. Much of the modern church doesn't want to hear this kind of preaching. We've changed it. But it's a problem. We're more concerned about filling the seats than we are about telling the truth. Amen. But we have to tell the truth. Yes. 
You need to understand that you don't have to leave here today. You don't have to wake up tomorrow still with broken law written on the tablet of your heart. Instead, your heart can be covered with the blood of the Lamb. And all it requires is for you to call out upon Him. All it requires is for you to say with simplicity and sincerity of heart, Jesus, I realize that I have failed you. I realize that I have sinned against you, Father. And I believe that you sent your son to die for me. And if you will say that and if you will mean that and you will receive him as your Lord and Savior, I'm telling you, he will change your life. Yeah. He will bring hope. You will, you know, John Wesley, the founder of the Methodist Church, it's a long story, but he, he, he was raised in the faith. His daddy was a preacher. His brother wrote multiple hymns, but he had actually been in ministry for years. And then one day he was actually in a Bible class. This was in the 1700s. And they were, they were teaching or reading Martin Luther. You ever heard of Martin Luther? He was the guy that started the Protestant Revolution. He was a Catholic monk. And he saw how they were charging the people, selling indulgences, and his heart was grieved. And Martin Luther read Romans chapter 3, verse 23. It said, and the just shall live by faith. And it changed his life. And then years later, 300 years later, John Wesley, after being in ministry for years, said he was seated in a classroom and they were reading Luther's words on that passage. And he said, my heart was strangely warm. Mm -hmm. For all that time, he had not even really been saved. He had been sitting in church and he had been preaching the gospel. But on that day, his heart was strangely warm. I just want to encourage you this morning. You call upon the name of Jesus and he will be faithful. Amen. To save your soul. And you will know that something has happened because the Bible says the Holy Spirit will come to live inside of your heart. And you will never be the same again. But you have to yield your heart to him. I've told the story many times of how I got saved and how I was such a Yahoo. That's the only way I know how to describe it. And I was sitting in church that day and that preacher kept saying blood and it made me so uncomfortable. I was like, man, I just wish he would stop. That's so like lame. What is blood? I was so uncomfortable, feeling weird, about to get up and walk out. Now I realize, see, I believe in the spiritual realm. Mm, yeah. So, uh, okay. I believe in the spiritual realm. And I believe demon spirits were trying to convince me to get out of there. That might make you feel weird. That might give you EBGBs, but I believe in a spiritual world. Yes, yes, that's right. And they were trying to make me get up and get out. Because she kept saying blood and it was so different. But then the Holy Spirit told she said it. She said this, the innocent one had to die in place of the guilty one. And at that moment, I knew I was the guilty one. And that Jesus was the innocent one and that he died for me. And it smoked my heart. And I'm so grateful that the Lord led me. To stop everything on that day. Mm -hmm. To push out the distractions of those lies. And to yield my heart to Jesus. And I've never been the same again. Praise God. Hallelujah. So listen, that's how you get saved. So some of what I talked to you about this morning may not make a whole lot of sense if you're not saved. But good news, now you know how to get saved. How do I get saved, preacher? Do I just raise my hand in the midst of the service at some point in time? No, I don't say that anymore. I'm not going that route. Would the Lord show me a son? You better make sure that they understand what they're getting into. That's right. That's right. And this is the posture of a person that's going to get saved. I'm not saying you got to do this today. It's whenever the Lord leads you. But guess what? Today is the day of salvation. Amen. This is the posture. Yes. On my knees in your presence, oh Lord God, I yield my heart to you. I believe that I was born a sinner, Lord, and I believe that you died on the cross for my sin I yield my heart to you and I ask you to save me, Lord. Thank you for dying on the cross for my sin. Come into my heart and please forgive me for my rebellion against you. Put your spirit on the inside of me, Lord God, and crucify my own life, my own desires in every sinful way that prevents me from getting closer to you. In Jesus' name I pray. It doesn't have to be exactly like that, but you get the point. You have to yield your life to him. Count the cost. Amen. Amen. All right, let's read. Martha and Mary. Now as they were traveling along, he entered a village and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. She had a sister called Mary who was seated at the Lord's feet listening to his word. But Martha was distracted with all her preparations. 
And she came up to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the serving alone? Then tell her to help me. But the Lord answered and said to her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and bothered about so many things, but only one thing is necessary. For Mary has chosen the good part, which shall not be taken away from her. Hallelujah. You can go back to the channel uh, one. Praise God. We just give you glory and honor, Lord. We thank you and praise you for your goodness and your grace and your mercy, oh Lord. We pray that you have your way this morning. Amen. I titled this morning's message, uh, Distractions, <coughs> Blockers of the Blessing. We have this story of Martha and Mary in the scriptures, and we don't really learn a whole lot about Mary from this story. I mean, if we dig around in the Gospels, we can learn more about her. But the scripture has certainly enlightened us quite a bit on Martha, just from some of the words that were spoken. We see a little bit about Martha's life here. She was distracted. She had a lot of work to do. You know, after all, a lot of work has to be done, right? I mean, there's a lot of work to be done upon this earth. There's a lot of be done, work to be done at the job, a lot of work to be done at the house, a lot of work to be done in the church. Somebody has to do the work. The King James Version uses the word serving instead of preparations. Interesting, it's the same Greek word if you've read much of the Bible. In the book of Acts, Stephen and Philip, when they became the first deacons, that's where deacons come from. It's a Greek word, diakonia. Where we get the word deacon, it means to serve. Stephen, the martyr, one of the first martyrs that's talked about in the word of God, who was full of the Holy Spirit and preached the gospel of Jesus Christ, started off as a table server. Right. There's something to having a humble heart, my friend. But she's doing the same thing. It's the same word, if you will, serving, preparing, doing the work that has to be done. Because, again, somebody's got to do the work. The King James Version uses some different words. It uses cumbered. Anxious, troubled. I wanted to talk to you a little bit about those words in the original Greek, just what they mean. The word comfort means to be dragged all around, dragged away, driven mentally, just basically just a little too busy. Careful. It really means anxious. To be troubled with cares. Concerned about one's own interests. I got stuff I got to do. I got stuff I got to get taken care of. There's things that need to be done. And that's what the word careful means. It means anxiousness, anxieties that come from me having to get all of these things done. Don't you see God? Don't you see all the things that have to be done? This word trouble, I like this word in the Greek, it's turbazo. The reason I like it is because it reminds me of when I was in the oil field. I had a couple of jobs in the oil field before I went to nursing school. But one of them was this word turbid. The word troubled means turbid. I used to work for a filtration company. We'd filter water to prepare drilling fluids. And we'd have a turbidity meter. And we'd filter the water and then we'd put it in this little vial and we'd stick it in this meter and it would tell us how much solutes was in there and whether or not we had filtered out enough of the solute. And so when the more solutes that were in the fluid, the more turbid the fluid was. Imagine, imagine a clear river that's got a silty bottom and all the silt has settled to the bottom and you can actually see through and you can see the fish and then you step in there and what happens? You trouble the water and all of a sudden it becomes murky and muddy and that's what's going on here she was troubled her mind was turbid it was filled with distractions that was what was going on with Martha she was troubled in her mind she was disquieted but that's not what the word of God says that we're to do the word of God says in 1 Peter 5 and 7 you don't have to turn there but listen cast all your cares on him for he cares for you that word care again in the Greek is anxieties. Cast all your anxiousness on the Lord. Jesus spoke about in Matthew chapter 10. He said, are not two sparrows sold for a farthing? That's a word for a penny. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet the Lord knows when a sparrow falls to the ground. He knows how many hairs are on your head. Are you not of greater value than a sparrow? 
And yet we have, we're disquieted, we're troubled, we have all of this chaos going on, this turbidity going on, murkiness, muddying up the waters of the, really what should be living waters pouring out of our spirit, man. We're troubled in mind and the Lord's saying, cast your anxieties upon him for he cares for you. Philippians 4, 6, and 7 says, Be careful, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer. How much are we praying, church? I know, listen, I'm not picking on anybody. You've got to understand, I'm just asking a question. It's a valid question. We're in a church today, right? We, we did show up in a church today. How much are we praying? I know that there's been some people that have been praying for the church, and I believe that those people that have been praying for the church have also been praying for their own lives. But no, really, I want us to think about this for a second. How much are we praying in our individual lives for our individual situations, our individual circumstances, for our children, for our jobs, for our home atmosphere, for our marriages, for our relationships? And then if we're not praying, what are we doing? What are we doing in order to solace the pain? What are we doing in order to try to clear up the water? What are we doing in try, trying to get rid of the, the disquietness on the inside of our heart and our mind? I'm sure we'll talk about that a little bit more. But he said, be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication. I like that word supplication because you know what it describes? It describes hunger. I'm hungry versus being self-sufficient. Maybe that's one of the reasons that, that the Lord talked about the fact that it would be more difficult for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God than it would be for a camel to make it through the eye of a needle. Maybe that's part of the problem that we have in America. Maybe that's part of the problem that we have in the American church. We're very self-sufficient. We don't have a whole lot of need for anything. But see, whenever you buy through prayer and supplication, a spiritual hungry place. When I know, see, when I pull those distractions out of my mind and I realize, no, something's not right. I'm disquieted in my soul. And I begin to listen to what the spirit of God's trying to tell me. Then the Lord would prompt me and he would lead me to get into his presence. Have you ever been in the presence of the Lord? And I know that many of you have. And, and if you haven't, I'm not trying to make you feel weird. I just want to let you know that there's a place that you can go. I want to let you know that in the midst of chaos, I'm talking about, I'm talking to the strongest of men. One of the problems I've shared this a lot, you know, and whatever, I mean, my dad talked about my dad probably too much, but you know, sometimes dads are a big deal. Yeah. My, and and it, it, he was so self-sufficient. He was so independent. Everything was pull yourself up by the bootstraps and to teach you, boy, take it on the chin. But really and truly, he didn't really do that because he had a drinking problem. Mm. Come on. Come on. He, it was a lot of talk. Right. Oh, and he was pretty tough. Right. I've heard stories, but that's not what's important because that doesn't really get you anywhere. But many times we try in our own strength to figure out the problems and we... And as men, especially as men, we don't want to show. We think that crying, we think that kneeling, we think that going to the Lord in prayer and opening up our heart is a sign of weakness. I know I've shared this story many times when my sister killed herself. And I don't mean to keep repeating the same stories over and over again. But when my sister killed herself, it was very, very painful for me. I was raised in a home, like I said, where there wasn't really crying, wasn't allowed and get thumped on the head, put a knot on your head, a lot of different things like that. And so there wasn't really a, an opportunity to understand how to be soft. And so you're hard. But listen, when that happened and the Lord revealed to me, because I was already a Christian for 12 years when that happened. And when the Lord began to speak to me, he showed me how hard my heart had been towards my sister. And that, and through that, he broke me. And it's the greatest thing that God ever did for me was to break me in his presence and to teach me the value of hunger and thirst and brokenness before the Lord. To, to be able to bring myself before God with tears, with heartache, 
with sorrow, to be able to pour my heart out to God and to be able to experience the presence of God healing me. As I would pour myself out, he was pouring himself in. All of the weights, all of the burdens, all of the concerns that life has to offer, as I began to pour myself out, he began to pour himself in. And in the midst of brokenness, I found great strength. It's a great strength that awaits each and every one of us. Doesn't matter what our gender, female or male, it awaits us. But our self-sufficiency and our unwillingness to be hungry in the presence of the Lord, our unwillingness to allow our, our, our shell to come down, to allow the walls to come down, to, to make ourselves vulnerable in the presence of the Lord, our unwillingness to trust God at that level prevents us from tapping into the greatest power that this earth has ever known. Here's what I found. Oh, here we go. <laughs> Distraction. <laughs> he says, be careful for nothing, for in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Amen. Isaiah 26 and 3 says this. You will keep him in perfect peace. Whose mind is stayed upon thee. Because he trusts in thee. It doesn't say. It, does, it says the mind must be stayed upon him. It doesn't say him and something else. Dot, dot, dot. Question mark. Whatever that is. You know that's one of the things that got me thrown off in the past. Whenever I first started preaching. However many years ago it was. And the Lord began to reveal to me. Because. You know, and I feel like I can talk about some of these things. I, people, people probably take me the wrong way. But listen, when you were born and raised Catholic and then you get saved out of Catholicism and then you go backwards and you reverse engineer all that stuff and you see the lies and the deception, it doesn't mean that every Catholic person is a liar and a deceiver. Absolutely not. There's many, many good Catholic people that genuinely love the Lord. They've just been brought in under a tradition of men. Uh, Peter warned about it in 1 Peter, in the letter of 1 Peter, from he, that God came to save us from the vain traditions of our fathers. Religion is tradition. Jesus is relationship. So I can talk about Catholicism if I want to because I was born and raised Catholic. I went to catechism. I got kicked out of catechism. <laughs> There's things that I feel as though I'm allowed to, to talk about. I've, I've put my trust in things that, that were not the Lord. I've been to rehab. I was in rehab three times before I turned 19. We're like, well, I knew that's why I didn't like you because I ain't never had that problem. Oh, well, holy, holy, holy. I'm sure you've done something, buddy boy, sister friend, right? You know what I'm talking about. You might have just got away with it. And one of the things that I started to talk about was that AA wasn't going to set nobody free. But the church has embraced it. They've mixed AA. They've mixed their psychological stuff along with the word of God. And they're, they're representing it as though it's something that's going to help people. And it's not going to help anybody. It's going to help people to continue to put their eyes on something else. It's a distraction other than giving them the purity of Jesus. Yeah. Well, you're going to mess people up. No, if they'll bow their knee to Jesus, I won't mess them up. Anyway, you will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee because he trusts in thee. Yeah. It said, but one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the good portion which shall not be taken away from her. Right here, I want to talk to you a little bit about some truth for your own personal life out of this story. And then we'll talk a little bit about truth for ministry out of this story. Jesus said there's one thing necessary. And I was just thinking about all the distractions in life, you know. But I have clothes to do, dishes to wash. Kids have to be bathed. I have to drive them to school. I'm single. I'm not married. I don't have help. Or the husband I do help, he doesn't do have, he doesn't help. Side note, there are a lot of distractions in our lives that were never God's will for our lives. Amen. Oh, I'm telling you the truth. I'm preaching a lot better 
then you're amen and amen. At least some of you are shaking your head. Listen, there are a lot of distractions in our lives that we have produced for ourselves. I meant to tell y'all something before we got started. There's probably going to be some conviction in this message, maybe. And there might be times that something hits your heart and it feels real. Ooh, you didn't like that. Can I let you in on a little secret? Kirk said a couple of things Wednesday night I did not like. When Brother Kirk preached, there was a couple of things that came out of his mouth that was like, boom! And I was like, Ugh! And then a couple of conversations took place afterwards, and it was just like, Ugh! and you know where I ended up? In my bedroom on the floor. With tears coming out of my eyes because I knew what the devil was trying to do. He was trying to cause you trouble. And I thought, now I'm thinking, boy, that's the most beautiful thing. That I get to sit in this audience every now and then and the prophet of the Lord will fix the right word. The exact phrase to hit me right where I don't want to be. So good news is now I know what you feel like sometimes. <laughs> but what you need to understand is that it's the word of the Lord. Yes. It's not the word of the preacher. That's right. You might be able to find somebody that says it in a way that you like it better. And I get that. But I love you. I love your soul. That's why whenever I, look, I don't mean to get off track here. But when I went out there for the Mardi Gras parade and Bill carried the cross and I went out there trying to sing Jesus on this little boom box thing. Whenever I could see their face scoffing at me. And laughing at me. Had some really good conversations with some young people from Morgan City High. Even some kids from Catholic High. A central Catholic home. But, but as I could see them, them scoffing at me. And, 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 I, and I would let them know. You know. That, that the reason. Why, why would a person do this? Like really. I mean it looks to the natural mind. You think that I'm, you think I'm naive. You think I don't realize how foolish that looks to the natural mind? Some people carrying the cross down a road, right. like in the middle of public. Right, right. You think I haven't counted that cost? You, me, like, I mean, seriously, dude. Like, I'm really, I, my whole life I was very concerned about appearance. Very concerned about appearance. You think I never thought about that? No, I thought about it. I counted the cost. You know? Why would, why would a person want to make themselves look so foolish? And I, and, 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 I, and I tried to tell them. They wouldn't ask me that, so I said it. Why would I make myself look foolish? Because I'm more worried about your soul than I am about my appearance. Yeah. I'm more worried about your soul. This is a way to get your attention. This is a way for me to break into your life. In the midst of the chaos and the turbidity and the distraction of life and going to work and trying to take care of the kids and all of the hustle and the bustle and all of the things that are taking place. I'm hoping that in the midst of them trying to numb the pain, trying to escape, that maybe the Lord would break through and maybe even now some of them still remembering some of the words that were spoken. Lord, I pray right now in the name of Jesus that you would draw them. Because listen to me, church. If this story is real, it's either real or it's not. Right, right. That's right. And if it's real, and I use the conjunction if just because not everybody agrees with me. If it's real, I'm telling you we're not paying enough attention to it. Okay. Listen to me. If you are an eternal being and separate from the blood of Jesus, you will stand before God on your own merits and in your own righteousness. And you yourself, each and every one of us, have failed the law of God. Yes. That means we're going to be guilty before the eyes of God. Right. And that means that the word of God says Jesus said this himself. Preachers don't want to preach it anymore, but Jesus preached it. Yes. And he said that hell is a place where the fire isn't quenched. The worm doesn't die and there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Yes, yes. Billions of years have gone by and you still can't free yourself. Right. Horror floods the soul when you thought, I thought it was okay. Mm. I, I was a good person. I didn't dip, I didn't chew, I didn't go out with girls that do. (laughs) 
You're not getting in on your own merit, my friend. Right. If that were the case, God the Father would not have bankrupted heaven of its most prized possession. That's it. That's right. He would not have caused his only begotten son to have to die naked on a cross right. in the midst of ridicule. Oh, help us, Lord. She's married. She's not married. She doesn't have help. When she does be married, she has a husband that doesn't help. A lot of distractions in our lives that were never God's will. His word is so clear in so many areas. And we blatantly ignore it. That is a problem in the modern church, my friend. Yeah. Yeah. I'm glad you showed up today. I hope you come back next week. But at the same time, let me just say this. We're going to tell the truth today. The word of God is here and it's written for us and God gave it to us. And no, it's not the word of a man. The Bible says of itself in the letter to, that Paul wrote to Timothy that the word of God is theonoustos, God breathed. God breathed this word in man and through man. He used him as a quill and the papyrus to communicate his word to man. If you were God, how do you think he's going to communicate? You speak in human language. He's going to communicate through human language. This is the written word that reveals to us the living word. The Spirit of God will reveal to you the truth of God's Word. Listen to me. The Word of God has been given to us, but we don't take the time. Even as believers, many times, and I'm talking to myself just as much as I'm talking to you, the Bible lays upon the shelf and it finds itself dusty. Our, tear, our eyes are dry. They haven't experienced tears in God knows how long. There would never be a callus on any of our knees because we haven't been upon our knees in God knows how long. I'm not trying to ridicule you. I'm trying to provoke you. I'm trying to provoke myself. To understand that God is real and that he's revealed himself through his word. And yet he's given it to us and we, we ignore it. We ignore it and we go about our own ways. There's no fear of God in the modern church. There's no reverence. There's no awe. The word of God says to work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. I used to for years say it's a mathematical term. Law gives oh my two plus two equals four. Just do the math. No, it's more than that. With fear and trembling, the enemy is a deceiver. He will make you and I think that we're okay when we're really not okay. The only way to find out is to yield yourself to the presence of the Lord. To cry out to him and to say, God, have your way with me. And we, we don't listen to the word of God and we make our own will for our own lives. Good news is, is that he's a restorer. Hallelujah. Aren't you glad? Good news is that he's merciful. He's gracious. He's loving. He's got, thank God he's all that. Because if he wasn't, dude, you're looking at one that'd be in big time trouble right now. But what I'm trying to say is, is that this is that I want to come to a place in my life where I can start yielding and obeying on the front end instead of making a bunch of mistakes and then asking him to bless all that on the back end. Does that make sense? I want to give him my ear. He said, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. That's not how it works, church. It works like this. We seek his will through his word and prayer. This is how it works to serve the Lord. You with me? We seek his will through his word and prayer. If we never open the book, and we never spend time in prayer. We will never know his will. We repent. <clears throat> where, where, where we realize through his word. Where we've transgressed his will. We repent. You know the word repent means to change the mind. The idea is, is that when we see the word of the Lord. And the Holy Spirit. Convicts our heart. Then what we do is we yield ourselves And we say okay Lord. This is your word. This is your will. I have transgressed your will. I changed my mind and I turn, I turn and go towards you and I forsake my rebellion behind me. And whenever I do that, then guess what happens? He sends refreshing and healing and provision and guidance and moving forward. We can get mad or we can receive the word of the Lord and recognize the errors of our lives where we have been in rebellion against God. I hope this is okay, church. Because it's not just it's not just the new visitors that might have showed up today. I'm not telling, I mean, I don't know where anybody's life is specifically. I'm just saying it's not just the visitors that showed up, it's us. Amen. It's up in this yes. church. Yes. You understand? I was like, oh no, I've been good. I've been repenting for the last six months. And guess what? He put a chisel on my heart Wednesday night. <laughs> 
Because we think that we're okay, but the more we open up, the more we let him in. And listen, when you get up from that little council session with your Lord, you're going to feel a whole lot better. Because see, repentance results in refreshing. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Refreshing. You ever been refreshed? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I turned, turned 10 years old in Singapore. We went to Malaysia for vacation. I got sunburnt like nobody's business. I don't know how refreshing it was, but I remember we went to go eat in a restaurant and there was a waterfall outside. Remember that, Mom? That waterfall? Surely you remember it. I think it was in Kuala Lumpur, the capital. I don't know. But they said, you can go swim in that water. It was freezing cold, man. I jumped in that water with that old sunburnt skin. Hallelujah. Took a little adjustment. But boy, after a while, it was refreshing. It made my skin feel better. That's repentance for our heart. We're carrying all this load around. We're carrying this weight. And when we yield it and give it over to the Lord, there's a refreshing that takes place. I just want to share that with you. I want to let you know so that if you walk out of here and I don't ever see you again, that you know that there is something that you can do. You can yield to the will of God. And he is that going to make it all better. Are you never going to have a distraction again? Are you never going to have a problem? Of course not. Jesus said this. What did he say? Same thing that that kid at Morgan City High told me on that parade route when he was in the back of that truck and I was talking to his friends right here and I didn't even see him. And he walked up to the front of the bed and he said, John 16 and 33. Face flustered, face flushed from drinking alcohol. John 16 and 33. In this world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer and he finished it. For I have overcome the world. Wow. Yeah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Seed of the gospel hid in that boy's heart. Wow. Full of chaos because he's in rebellion against God. God. But at the same time, it came out when it needed to come out. And I pray for him right now in the name of Jesus. Yes. Bring him to his knees, yes, Lord. Jesus. Bring him to his knees, oh Lord God. Because see, in the midst of this world, you will have tribulation. It's fallen. The world is not your friend. Jesus said, if they hate you, remember they hated me first. Nobody wants to be hated. It's not that hard for me because I was never popular in school. People didn't really like me that much. I think it was because I was obnoxious. <laughs> that was my own fault. So I, I don't expect to be popular. I don't want to be popular according to the world standards. Other people may struggle with that. Thank God I don't struggle with that. I'm convinced Jesus is the way. Hallelujah. I thank God for that. Many people make decisions that will affect their lives for years. One example is to have children outside of God's prescribed order. Is the child beautiful? Of course. How, I mean, I get that. As of right now, I still have a little job in pediatric medicine. Let me tell you, buddy. Sometimes them little babies, oh my gosh, I love me some babies. They are so cute. Snot don't bother me. Pee pee don't bother me. I love them beautiful little babies. They're so beautiful till they hit two. <laughs> and then they start talking and acting out in rebellion. You thought changing diapers was hard, my friend. What about raising a child that won't end up perishing in hell? Can we believe that it's possible? That our own children that we love with all of our hearts and we meant so well and we provided for them and we put them in the best of schools and we bought them the best of clothes and we even bought them a car, a brand new car when they were 16 and we blessed them with all of the accoutrements of the world and yet what does it profit a man if he gained the whole world yet he loses his own soul? Yes. Help us. Help us, Lord. Yes, Lord. What about that? Well, if their daddy would help, no, you don't need their daddy's help. You need your father to help their daddy. Yes. You need your father to help you. You need your father to help your children. How do I do that? Well, the world says that smoking pot helps. That's a lie. The world says, listen, no, 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 no. If you have cares and anxieties, Xanax will help. Right. Depression medicine will help. Can I tell you a secret? Listen, I'm not trying to get too crazy here. I'm not going to pick up nobody's guitar because I'll probably break it. But I wanted something bigger than this. Maybe I can just use this iPad. Anything that I put between me and the Lord. Do you think that Zen, that smoking pot will prevent me from making the connection 
of the most important thing. He's up there, but I've got marijuana lingering over my brain. And you think that you think you can hear the Lord properly if you got Xanax in your system? Come on, man. Right, right. You think you can hear the Lord properly if your neurochemical processes in your brain, your neurology is being changed? Oh, you're taking a chance, preacher. You don't know right. I'm taking a chance. I'm not telling you to stop your medicine. I'm telling you to get a hold of Jesus. Yeah. I'm telling you to get all to Jesus. I'm telling you to quit being like Martha. I'm asking us to quit being like Martha and to allow all of these distractions to take place in our life and for us to learn how to be more like Mary. They prevent us from hearing the voice of God, these distractions. Those things will deceive you into thinking that you're okay. You're not okay if you're living in sin. Then what do I do? You cast your cares on you. That's right. God wants to turn it around. Yeah. I was thinking about, I was thinking about y'all three right there. This isn't going to work for the rest of it, but I thought about that song. He wants to turn it around. He wants to work in your favor. God's going to, I know I can't sing. God's going to turn it around. Y'all can see, y'all can see Brian up there on that chair. You can see Rachel with them long legs. And around, and around. God wants to work in our favor. He wants to turn it around. Yeah. Late in the midnight hour. Like Paul and Silas in the Philippian prison in the midst of darkness when there seemed to be no hope, when there seemed to be no help, God came in and he turned it around. The earthquake shook the prison. The doors opened up and they were freed from the shackles and the chains that bound them. The spirit of God set them free. But people sometimes like their shackles and chains. We like to hold on to those things our flesh desires. See, that's a stronghold, my friend. The enemy wants to erect strongholds in our mind that begins to be a factory that produces lies in our heart. The Word of God says that He has set us free. Yes. And the stronghold in our mind says, yeah, Jesus just can't set me free from this one. It's a little too bad because you don't even know what I've been through, preacher. I was molested by my grandfather when I was young. What you going to do about that one, preacher? Your daddy just yelled at you. Your daddy, well, I can't even say what my daddy said. I'd be too inappropriate. Your daddy just said bad things to you, preacher. You don't know what I'm going through. I don't know what you're going through. But I do know you ain't the only one that's ever been Amen. through it. I do know that there have been women that have been raped yeah. by their grandfathers, yeah. by their fathers, repeatedly, multiple times, by multiple men. And in the midst of their brokenness, God showed up yeah. and healed them and restored them and strengthened them and lifted them up and used them as vessels to tell the truth. I'm here to tell you, Jesus sets the captive free. So I don't know what you've been through. I don't know what you're going through now, but I'm here to tell you there's an answer. And the world doesn't have the answer. Jesus has the answer. And he died on the cross to give it to you. And he wants to release it into your life. Release it now, Lord, in the name of Jesus. He wants to turn it around, but he requires something from us. And it's called repentance. He wants us to quit blaming everyone else around us. And he wants us to take responsibility for our rebellion against his word. He wants us to choose the good portion to sit at his feet. To drink from the cup in his hand. To lean up against him and breathe. To feel his heartbeat. He wants us to choose the good portion. Yes, Lord. He wants us to choose what Mary chose. Hallelujah, Lord. She chose the river of anointing that was flowing out of him. We weren't there, but Jesus was in the house, my friend. He was speaking. Imagine that. Listen. Some of y'all done seen some preachers before that really had an anointing flow out. Right, y'all been in some some services where you can really, really feel the spirit of God. Right? Imagine sitting in a house where Jesus is preaching. Amen. Now we've talked about being around Paul before. Mm. Imagine being around Jesus. Oh. <laughs> Imagine the spirit of God flowing off of those lips, the oil flowing. Her Mary. 
Her soul is longing for this. Mary's soul is longing. Martha's right there. She's in the same spot, but she's distracted. She's in the very same geographical space, but she's distracted. You are in here and some of you are tuned in and God is saying something that can help you and you will receive his word and it will help you. And some people are distracted. Looking at the phone, turbid mind full of a thousand different worries, cares and concerns. That's Martha. She misses her moment of visitation. She chooses something else. Something other than the good portion. And the result is that it results in lust of the flesh. Envy, frustration, jealousy, irritation. You see her, Lord. You see all this work. You see me distracted. You see me doing. Make her stop. Jesus ain't taking this away from Mary, girl. He'll be happy to take that ugly that's all over you right now away if you let him. But he's not going to take this away from Mary. This is why he came. He came so that we could connect to his anointing. He came so that we could connect to his spirit so that we could receive true healing. Listen, this ain't just playtime, my friend. I heard a preacher the other night. He said, we're not in a playground. You're on a battleground. The enemy wants to destroy you. Do you believe this word I'm trying to tell you this morning? There is a real enemy that wants to destroy you, but Jesus has come to make a way so that the oil of the presence of the Holy Spirit can flow into your life. And it could be in the Old Testament. He said the balm of Gilead. He's like medicine. He's like medicine to a broken heart. He will heal you. Amen. He will restore your life. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. If you let him. Yes. Now talking about the work of the ministry, the presence and anointing of the Lord will always draw attention in the crowd. I believe that. Once the crowd arrives, there will always be work to do. When Jesus is present, people will be present. And where there are people, there are ministry needs. Amen. Martha is serving and she's doing the diaconia, the, the deacon. She's serving. So she's trying to do good. She's trying to serve God. But everything she's doing is in the flesh. It's in her own strength. There's no anointing on this effort. And so we have these two examples of response to the presence and ministry towards the Lord. One scurries and flits around, distracted, irritated, frustrated, can't really get much done. Because she's consumed with busy work. And it only produces jealousy towards others. The other one sits at his feet and receives the oil of his presence. It's a time of preparation. A time of filling for the purpose that she would be poured out later. She will return to his feet again. She will bring the oil she saved and pour it back upon him. That's work for the Lord. That's the spirit of God. Haley, maybe you could go to John chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. We're not going to go to Mark 14, 3 through 9, but that tells us that there's a very similar story. It doesn't give us her name, but that's the woman with the alabaster box. She had spike in her in that alabaster box, and she broke it at the feet of Jesus. But what I want you to see in John chapter 12, verses 1 through 3 Then Jesus, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, which had been dead. You know, Lazarus was Mary and Martha's brother, whom he raised from the dead. There they made him a supper, and Martha served. She's serving again. But Lazarus was one of them that sat at the table with him. Then took Mary a pound of ointment of spikenard, very costly. And anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the odor or the fragrance of the ointment. Can you imagine that? I mean, I've preached this multiple times and I can't help but think, you know, Judas was in there and he starts kind of running his mouth. And the Bible tells us he just did that because he was a thief and he wanted the money. But you know, the Bible says that the fragrance of that ointment filled the atmosphere. And I was thinking, we don't know for sure, but it seems like she's probably the only one that left with that fragrance on her. It was all up on her hair, man. All in her hair. (laughs) All over her hands. Surely she probably wiped it on her garment. 
You know, can you imagine? I mean, she's, now she smells the same way Jesus smells before he's about to die. He's about to die on the cross. They say that this would have been a year's worth of wages. I, you know, I really want to start teaching more about giving, but you know, I know we live in a, I listen, we live in a time frame where everybody, all these prosperity preachers and people get weirded out whenever you start talking about money. But can I tell you a biblical truth that you can't outgive give God? Can I tell you a biblical truth that when you give into the house of God, when you give into the work of God, that the Lord will reciprocate and he will give back into your life? I promise you, I am telling you the truth. I'm just telling you right now, I will tell you the truth. I'm so excited, not that there's not any uncertainty that's been in the way to get me to the place where I sent an email yes two days ago and said, let this be the notice. I'm giving you my 90 day notice. I'm not gonna be a full-time employee anymore. I'm gonna be become PRN. And from there I have the freedom to stop working as much as I want. No hold on me. I'm giving them the 90 days because it's the right thing to do. I'm about to take a step of faith. I, I serve the God who owns the cattle on a thousand hill. Listen, he paves the streets in gold. Listen to me. I, I know I keep saying it, and y'all forgive me for repeating it. I was sitting at 17 through 19 years old on an air conditioning unit with a high, I was a high school dropout. I, had, I didn't have two nickels to rub together. My life was bound up in one night on a snubbing unit in a, on a rig job underneath the light, squeegee in the deck at two o'clock in the morning. The Lord spoke to my heart and said, I have something better for you. Not that that was a that was a noble job. The Lord told me, though, and I went to school and I became a nurse and then I became a nurse practitioner. But now the Lord has called me into something great. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. I trust. And listen, I ain't in this for financial gain. I know he's going to take care of me. Praise God, as long as I'm listening to his voice, I know he's going to take care of me. But listen, you can't outgive God. Hallelujah. I'm just trying to make a point. Why are you bragging? No, I'm not. I'm trying to brag it on Jesus, man. That's right. If he has done this to a high school dropout, what does he have in the future? Because it's not even about monetary gain. I want to get that out of my mind. She took a pound of spike nerd. Costly, a year's wages, and she poured it out at the feet of her Savior because he gave her something that she could not buy with Amen. money. Hallelujah. Yeah. Yeah. He gave her something that her heart craved, yes, yes, yes. Yeah. and she just wanted to give him everything. Yes, oh, Lord. I want to give him everything. Hallelujah. 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 This kind of love, devotion, and ministry is not for women only, my friend. I've seen this type of love written in God's word, words from David's pen popping off the page that have warmed the coldest of hearts and put tears in the driest of eyes. Let's turn to Psalm chapter 42, verses 1 through 3, because I want to tell you that this kind of love and devotion and ministry is not for women only. I've seen this type of love written in God's word, words from David's pen. It'll bring tears to the driest of eyes. Most of these psalms of desperation are a cry whenever David is in the wilderness. He's on the run. Absalom's trying to steal his throne. Saul won't let him have his throne. And David is away. He's running for his life. He can't get to the temple of God. Look at Psalm 42. Verses 1 through 3. These are psalms that were written either by David or by his musicians as the heart. The heart is another word for a deer. As a deer pants after the water brooks, so pants my soul after you, O oh God. I just want to stop for a second. And I want you to just imagine this. A deer understands water. Since it was a little bitty fawn or whatever you call him. I'm not a hunter. I don't know. But whenever, since he was a little bitty thing, his mama taught him how to find water. Maybe he's desperate right now. Maybe he was in the midst of the woods and a, a wrong angled arrow hit him in his hind quarters. It's not a kill shot, but he's on the run. He's desperate and he's, and he's seeking and he's been running and he's longing. His soul is thirsty. His body is fatigued and he needs water. Water to replenish him. David says that just as a deer is panting after the water brooks, so my soul it pants after you. My soul thirsts for God. Listen, you know what we're talking about right here, man. I'm talking to the men right now. I'm not looking at the eyeball, make you feel weird or make myself feel weird. I'm talking to the men right here. 
This is young David that sat in a field. You might think, I don't know what you think. I know what I would have thought. Sitting there strumming a harp as the green grass is flowing, taking care of them sheep. I probably, look, back in the day, listening to my dad talk, I probably would have thought David was a sissy till he jumped up and <sighs> threw that sling, threw that rock in that giant's head, cut that giant's head off with his own sword, warrior king, learning how to battle in the spirit of the Lord, learning how to battle another way, learning how to find and tap into true power and true strength. Not self-sufficient. When shall I come and appear before God? My tears have been my meat. It means that was his food day and night. While they continuously say unto me, where is thy God? That's a good word for you whenever you're going through things. And it feels like God is distant and you can't hear his voice. And you cry out to him and you're sad. Listen, the word of the Lord will renew your strength. Look at Psalm 63 verses 1 through 4. Psalm 63, 1 through 4. O oh God, you are my God. Early will I seek thee. I want to encourage you. Listen, you know what the Bible says about Jesus? Mark 1, long before the break of day, he got into a solitary place and there he prayed. Our Lord prayed before the sun rose. The psalmist says, you are my God. Early will I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh thirsts longs for you. If you don't feel thirsty for the presence of the Lord, start reaching out to him. And guess what? He's going to start making you thirsty and a dry and thirsty land where no water is to see your power, your glory. So as I have seen you in the sanctuary, because your loving kindness is better than life, my lips shall praise thee. I love this right here. Verse four. Thus will I bless thee while I live. I will lift up my hand. In your name. Psalm 143, 6 through 7. Psalm 143, 6 through 7. I stretch forth my hands to you. My soul thirsts after you as a thirsty land. Selah. Hear me speedily, O Lord. My spirit fails. Hide not your face from me, lest I be like them that go down to the pit. I don't know about you, but I don't want to go down to the pit. Singers, musicians, y'all can come as I read Psalm 43, verses 4 through 5. Psalm 43, 4 through 5. Then will I go unto the altar of God, unto God my exceeding joy. Yea, upon the harp will I praise thee. O oh God, my God, why art thou cast down, O my soul? Why art thou disquieted within me? Hope in God, for I shall yet praise him, who is the health of my countenance and my God. Once you know where you are on those keys, you can just start playing lightly when you're ready, but I'm almost done right here. You know, maybe the difference between Mary and David is that this is her first time there. You know what I'm saying? He showed up in the house and he's speaking. And maybe this is her first time experience it. Whereas David, he's been there. He was in the field. He was seeking, writing, singing, experiencing the presence of God. He's been in the temple, but now he's on the run. He can't get to the temple where God's presence is located, but he longs for it. He's thirsty. He's hungry. You know, I just want to say this real quick. It doesn't matter whether you've ever been in the presence of the Lord or whether you've been there and now you feel far away. I want to just let you know this, that if you will draw near to him, the word of God says that he will draw near to you. I want you to open your heart up this morning. Let the spirit lead you. If you need prayer this morning, I want you to know the altars are open. If you need healing in your body, if you need deliverance for your soul, if you need God to minister, to your mind. He's here this morning. I believe that. I believe that he wants, to, he wants to minister to you. You know, the proper version of a Christian life and a servant of God is a working Martha whose work is an overflow of praise. It's a pound of spikenard, perfume of praise that comes out of the overflow of time spent in his presence 
like Mary. Have your way in our hearts this morning, Lord. Have your way in our lives and our families.